Sanctuary Romeo, 5-2 vehicle failing to stop. Confirm sting aside. Vehicle stung, vehicle stung. Welcome to Some Say Podcast, fascinating car stories. Today I'm joined by Benny Boy from the Police Interceptors. Thank you for joining. Thank you um, so much. I have really, I mean, I love watching Police Interceptors late at night, sit back, and it's just, um, I mean, you, you sense the adrenaline because it's such a, it's real life situation. You filmed a bunch of series, I say you filmed these series, but really they were filming you in situ doing your real day job. Yeah, we were on series 15 to 18. Um, they filmed for about two and a half, three years with us, and it, it just become part of norm. They'd sit in back at car, they'd go out with us, um, and yeah, it's not toned down uh, for what we do. I, I, if anything, it's um, it, it gives people an insight into what we do in, in reality. Because I think there's a there's a lot of cop shows out there that are toned down, uh, and Interceptors is that popular because it's not, and it shows the real nitty gritty, so to speak, of what we do. It's mad though, isn't it? Because you you're, you're out there policing, doing actual pursuits arresting people and stuff like this but with camera team as well yeah so it must be in the back of your mind i've got to look after them as well as do my job it's, it's surprising because one of the lads um james is uh trains in crab maga and he's ultra fit so we've had a few foot chases when he's bypassed us and he's gone past us running after the criminal <laughs> so we're actually saying to him calm down you slow down but he's camera up or sound man he's camera up okay and he's running with the camera all the gear on he's got a tap vest on and he's running after them and he's, he's he's right behind them so sometimes we're slow down plays we need to catch up so he's missed his calling yeah basically i think that's what i wanted to do with bobby to be a bobby so how many seasons of that did you do we did 15 to 18 and it just drifted over from 18 into 19 but they called it an extension yeah. tv talk and that sort of thing um we're just saying while, while we're talking do i need to have a translator with me or are you all right with me we'll put subtitles on for you because you know <laughs> obviously so that we can actually understand what it is that you're saying um, i can just about tune into it or trying you know now that we're up north but no, you, you've done this a long time is it 19 years 19 years in west Yorkshire police yeah and i retired in 2020 due to complex post-traumatic stress disorder so how do you become a police interceptor because there's a lot of people who would want to you know do do a job like that it's i know i know it will sound more glamorous than it is and it's actually an incredibly tough job to do but if you're starting out you want to be the police but what's the career path to get into the hot seat yeah you start the the career you've got to do two years in uniform that's where you learn your craft but we always used to say do four or five because you need a bit of wool on your back so to speak um, and then what you do, you've got to apply for roads policing. And you think it's easy, but it's not. So they might just say there's 12 jobs coming out. There might be 500 applicants. So you've got to be whittled down. So you've got to do, first of all, your paper safety, your interview. Um, and once you've passed that, you've got to have your face. And it, I'm sorry to say, your face has got to fit as well. Because there's a lot of people that want to go for the role, thinking it's the be all and end all. You can drive the fast cars, you can do the action stuff. But a lot of people can't and they realise that when they come into the office, it's like, no, it's not for me. It's it's hard pursuing a car at 150 miles an hour, dealing with a dead body, then going home to your wife and children. It's got a different aspect of policing to what normal policing is. Plus, it's the most dangerous one. Even though there's firearms, you're more likely to be killed in traffic than you are in firearms. Um, so you apply, you get into traffic, you've got to do, this is, this is the hard part, you've got to do two years probation in traffic but you've got to do your advanced driving course, which is four weeks long. So I say it's like driving your normal car, doing your normal driving test. But you've got to do that for eight hours a day, five days a week at 130 mile an hour. If under observation. Under observation. If you fail or you muck up, you're off. If you fail the test at the end of it, you only get one more chance and you're out of traffic. In the meantime, you've got to do your advanced law one, two and three, which are two, three week courses and then you've still got to have your portfolio signed off within two years. Again, if you fail your driving, no matter if you've done your advanced law one, two and three, you're kicked off. So there's a lot of pressure and you've got to maintain the standard all the time and it's not easy. Once you've done that, you signed off out of your two years, you've got to have a big skill set. You've got to be teapot trained, laser trained, intoxilizer trained for drink driving, drug trained. Once you've got all them, they'll come to you and say, right, 
do you fit the capabilities of what we're looking for? Uh, if they do, it's down to the film crew to look at you, you have a bit of a chat, and then if you've got it, the, you, you get onto it, so to speak, and you become a tight-knit team of interceptors. Because listening to you when you're doing your thing, it's like a flight helicopter. You've got, you're multitasking. It's the, not just the driving, the, the car's moving, but that's just like breathing. But yeah. It's all the comms and the coordination with other things that are going around in your mind. That's a massive skill, isn't it? It isn't just a driving skill. It's something completely different. Yeah, I, I mean, anyone can drive a car. It's about how you drive the car. And what we've got to do, it's got to be second nature. You've got not to think about what you're driving. It's got to be a plan. So you, you're doing plans in your head all the time. So as we've just been around the track, if you're driving and you get a bit of over or understeer, you've got to just use what you know in your pedals and your steering to be able to do it. But if we're driving at 100 miles an hour and a 30 mile an hour limit, overtaking cars, we're also putting a plan into place. So I need to know where, where Ben is, I need to know where Dan is, what cars are coming from, what capabilities are coming, where helicopters are coming from. Can you put a stinger on this road? Well, you can't because it's the wrong bend. And at the same time, and I still need to be saying we are now nine zero miles now. We are left, left, left. It's still safe to continue. Not only that, I'm thinking about road traffic law and what the criminals doing. And if the criminals understeer and oversteer and getting too dangerous, I need to be doing a risk assessment all the time. So when you pursue a criminal and the criminal is always saying to you, well, I got away. Yeah, but I'm in an high powered car doing comms, which they can't do. All they're doing is just laughing and joking think about road safety, think about health and safety, think about what the bandit vehicle's doing and putting a plan into my head and talking to Empass when it's 300 miles away coming at 150 miles an hour to get to us. And that plan needs to be done so no one gets injured. And so, if, sorry. Yeah. No, no, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot going on. Yeah, and if they do get injured, it all falls on me. It's me holding the brass reel. So you can be in a pursuit with somebody and if they have a crash and die, you could go to prison. So you're risking everything you know, you're risking your job, you're risking your house, your loved ones, your pension, everything for that criminal who's trying to make off from you. So you want to put it to bed safely and in accordance with your training. It's not easy. No, pressure. And you also picked the, the busiest part of the country, apparently, or one of them, which is in Yorkshire. So Bradford. <laughs> Bradford. So where everyone loves to, to have a souped-up car or borrow a souped-up car and then yeah. go out and razz it around at the weekend. Yeah. So it's a, it's a tough one. I think every other car's an RS3. Every, every car makes off from you. No one Great stops. Car. Yeah, no one stops. Um, they'll make off from anything from no insurance to to having a mirror not on the side of the car. Even we always say even solicitors that are going to represent someone in court, they'll fail to stop for you. It's it's just a it's just a joke. Um, and life, I say, it's life's cheap. There, there's the amount of people that are killed in cars. It, it, it's astonishing because no one understands the fact that your car can only go around the corner at a certain speed, and that tree's not going to move. Uh, and no matter how much we try to educate people, it just Every year, just the same, same. So yeah, it's a bad place to work. So how many pursuits a month or year do you, would you, were you doing when you were in your sort of top of your career, when you'd been there a while and you were out there all the time? In Bradford, you're probably looking about three a week, maybe four. Three a week? Yeah, or maybe four just a week. Just on you, not the whole? Yeah, yeah, no, just on us. Um, and there's a difference between a car makes off to a, what we call a proper pursuit. So if a car makes off, gives chase, that's what they used to call it, I'm going to give chase, that's when they'll do two lefts and a right and decamp. A proper pursuit, decamp, decamp jump run out, off. run off, go through yeah. an alleyway. Get giving, chased by a dog. Yeah, giving you a finger, laughing and joking. Right. A pursuit is when there's a, a bank robbery, an ATM machine, a Hanoi, which is where they break into your house to steal your car keys, so it's normally a, a robbery or a violent robbery. Um, they're probably one a week, uh, and they're the proper, proper, I'm not stopping for anyone, I'm going to ram every single car I can get. I'm going to risk my life, I'm going to risk your life, and chances are someone's going to end up on the roof. Uh, that's probably one a week as a full, and I'm sorry for my language, balls out pursuit. That includes everybody, and that's literally like, and when I say one a week, that's per shift. So seven days on, or however you were working at the time, it was constant. You, you couldn't drive out of the nick without dropping a car that felt stop, and it was shooting fish in a barrel. So yeah, you learn your craft very quickly. That's mental. You would have thought you'd run out of boy racers. No. Or whatever they were, boy racers and slash hardened criminal. Yeah. But no, next generation just comes through. So I were doing this when I first joined at 25, and then when I retired at 40, 45, whatever, I was still doing it then. Uh, and it just doesn't stop, it just comes. And, but I think the, how can I say, the life cheap thing again kicks in for every generation more. So it becomes the point of where people get away or want to get away faster and harder for less of an offence. So where before it'd have to be something like murder, they've failed to stop from, now it's just no insurance. Now it's something, a non-payment of fines warrant. 
there's something they'll fail to stop and they'll risk everybody's life for nothing at all. And if you watch a lot of it, opposite interceptors or things like that, they'll fail to stop and they're legal. They've got the license, got insurance, it's their car, but they'll just decide to fail to stop because they were scared. And uh, I, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. What's it like now then, um, policing in the UK? Um, from when I started in 2001, I, I treated as it were a full knit team. Um, and, and this is not derogatory to any force or any police force, how things are now, but the more people I speak to as well, and from when I've retired, uh, from 2001, close knit team, code zero, go out, everyone had run towards your head. Code zero is basically like I'm getting it right, kicking off, something really bad's happened. Um, and then all the bosses really being above you and caring and looking down on you, treating you like you're my children and I'm, I'm making sure you're going to be the best you can be. To get into the point of everyone just burnt out, everyone's tired, um, there's no staff, there's no one to go to. All. You've got jobs coming out at box, left, right and centre, shouting anyone for the media, anyone for this, anyone for that. No one's there, no one's shouting up. It's just it's just hard and it's it's got worse. So the, the, the violence against Bobbies is getting worse. The lack of respect for Bobbies, it's just unbelievable. And I can't understand why there's so many people now that say defund the police. It's not fit for purpose, but if they defunded the police, it'd be anarchy. It'd be anarchy, everything would be looted, houses would be burnt down, people would be getting murdered in the streets. It'd be horrendous. Um, the police are there for a reason, but everyone goes into the police and puts the vest on and gets the baton and cuffs and everything to make a better tomorrow. And I can't say that without sounding cheesy, but to make a better tomorrow. But as soon as you go through the door, it's job, 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 job. Auditors, people putting cameras in your face, people abusing you, people hitting you when you're on the floor. And no matter what they do, they try and come in, Bobby's, but it's just hard. And next day you've got to come in, you've got to pick yourself back up, come in again and do better with less. And it's harder, and I, I'm, 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 I'm glad I'm done because I couldn't have taken any more. And if I wasn't pulled out when I pulled out, and if I wasn't stopped when I was stopped, I wouldn't be here today. Can I ask you a cheesy question? Ask me anything you want. Are you sure? Nine inch only on a Tuesday, and if the vicar says no, it's illegal. I knew it. <laughs> I knew that. I knew that already. All right, but uh, sorry, but have you have you fired a taser? I haven't fired a taser. No. You haven't. No. Because I watched the Hangover. Yeah. Is that, that's not, I mean, he gets shot in the head, in yeah. the face, which yeah. is not where you're meant to shoot it, is it? No, no. Where are you meant to aim for those um, things? So you're probably trained with the taser. Yeah, so you, you, you aim in your centre quarter, yeah. and it fires two barbs out, and the two barbs go, make a circuit across you, and that constricts your muscles. So people that are trained with tasers, they'll rack it out, and they normally red dot you. And when red dot's a bit like, don't do anything, and then bang. But it, actually, the barbs go into you. So you get a red dot, which means yeah. don't move. So yeah. if you look down, you could be being told, stop yeah. moving. Proper like Terminator or okay. Predator, like the red dot. And then the barbs go into you. You've got to be normally removed by someone because they're actually like fishing hooks deep into your skin. Yeah. Um, but there is times when people shoot it and it doesn't work because it actually attacks to the clothing and it doesn't go in or the barbs too close together. So it is quite hard, but yeah, I've seen it when they shoot him in the face. It's quite funny as well. You've seen that? Um, I've, no, I've seen the hangover. Oh, they've seen the hangover. But I've, I watched the man get tased. went to a, a violent assault and a man came out running at my colleague, Mickey Mike. Ironically, we've all got strange names. And he just racked tears up. I went, tears, tears, tears him. Bang! And he shot it and this lad just went literally like a, a rigid board and straight down on his face. Now, I shouldn't have laughed and then people might look at me and go, What's Bobby laughing for? But it just looked so surreal. It just didn't look right. And it was kind of thing I just went, yes, yes, so he's it down. it's like the movie. Yeah, it's very much like the movie. It drops, you, it drops you straight away. Bloody hell. Yeah, it drops you straight away. But yeah, I've been CS gas, then I've shot several firearms as well. You've used the CS? I've used CS gas and I've been CS gas as well. By your mates or? Uh, you get CS gas in training. Brilliant. And then I've been CS gas several times and I actually thought I were immune to it, but I wasn't. And then... One day I got sprayed properly and I've never felt pain like it. Really? If is you want to know what it's like, it's, it's, it's eyes, nose, breathing, it senses everything. If you want to know what it's like, think about eating the hottest curry in the world, rubbing pepper in your eyes, yeah. and then uh, nettles on your face. All it sounds at the same like time. a tequila stunt, man. It does, but I've not had one of them, but will you give me one? Yeah, you're supposed to <laughs> inhale the tequila. Uh, sorry, no, the Tabasco. Um, the t I can't remember what it is now. <laughs> what is it? Squeeze the lemon in your eye. Drink, yeah, drink the tequila and, and, and snort the Tabasco, I think. Not snort Tabasco? I think that's what oh, it is. But yeah, yeah it's like that. It and you literally cannot see, you cannot breathe. It disorients you. You've got liquid coming out of every single bit of your face. It's literally, your nose is running. It's horrible. And I always thought I were immune to it. And then I got a can in my face once wrestling with this burglar. And I thought, this is horrible. And no matter what you do, you're meant to say, right, look at the wind. 
the wind blows it because it's little particles that normally stick in your skin and if you look at the wind eventually they just blow off your skin and when I looked at the wind it was like literally set myself on fire it just got hotter and hotter and it was horrendous don't get sprayed it's no. horrible all right well I, I won't I mean I would pull over yeah I'd be like I'm done Dan can you put that spray back in your bag bar you don't need to spray me What's, I mean, the pursuit term, what's the longest ever pursuit you've ever been on? Because the keeping focus and concentration, like with a race, I know that, that that's, but that's a different thing. But I think the adrenaline will be very high with yeah. what you do. It, it, one, of the, one of the main things when your adrenaline peaks, it plateaus instantly because of the, like, where you're driving, it, because of the expertise or the level you've got. The longest one I've probably been on is probably about 15 to 20 minutes, which uh, driving at high speed through a town centre um, is a long time. But the longest in distance we got in, involved in a pursuit which were quite funny and on uh, M62 we were going to lock a prisoner up they were going to uh, pick a prisoner up and we're heading towards Manchester and I'm behind this car and the car's swaying all over the road and next thing you know I notice an X5 behind this car and I'm thinking like what's going on here it's a traffic car and it's behind this it's behind this car swaying all over the road and no matter what it made I just couldn't grasp what was going on and ironically I was sat behind a pursuit and then I'll try to patch into the radio channel and say, look, I'm behind this car. It's thing it's filling us up. I think we're in GMP. Can you grid me? So they've got a system which tells you where you are. Let me know what channel I need to be on. And I'll patch you and say, look, Bradford car, I'm sat behind you. I'll join it t -Pat. This has gone on for about 10 miles. And again, by that point, I've been passed by an X5. And it's like, lads are looking at me like that. It says West Yorkshire on the side of my car. I'm giving them thumbs up. And they're just looking at me again. Another car goes past, then Dogman goes past looking at me. And I've joined in the pursuit, but him in X5 at front are saying, can that unit move up, move up, move up to get involved in pursuit? And it's just me sat there. It's gone on now for about another 20 miles. By that time, helicopters above, shining light on us. Um, and then it, eventually the car got boxed in and we got out and then we got a big round of applause for not being involved. Did a bit of a bow, got it car and drove off really quickly. So lengthwise, that's probably the longest one, uh, a good amount, probably it's gone on nearly 25, 30 miles is that one. Um, probably about 50 miles an hour at motorway, but it was a drunk driver. Um, each one brings its own difficulties. And the, there's a terminology saying there's no such thing as a safe pursuit. All pursuits are dangerous. Um, you can't know who you're going to be locking up whether they're carrying weapons, what they're running for. You can have a murder run for you, an armed robber. You can have someone that's wanted as a tourist, or you could have someone that's just beating the missus up or beating their husband up and got in the car and drove off. So each pursuit, how they're driving and what their intentions are, are completely different. One person might just want to go the wrong way down a motorway, and that's something you don't do. So that's where we would ram your head on, put your vehicle to bed there and then. So when you see it on TV and they try to do a U-turn on the motorway, that's why cop cars get smashed up. Because one thing we'll not do is let someone go the wrong way down the motorway because it'll end up in a fatal event. Because it's totally dangerous, yeah. I've seen some people do it by mistake, but obviously that's totally different. But when you, yeah. up, when you deliberately go down it, it's such a dangerous thing to do that yeah. you have to deal with it immediately. I mean, 60 miles, 70 mile an hour one way, 70 mile an hour other way, impact speed of 140 is going to kill everyone. Uh, and we just won't let it happen. So that's when we'll use tactical contact and put you to bed straight away. And the pit manoeuvre is part of that as well, isn't it? So <clears throat> Now this is a deep conversation you're going in now. UK police do not teach pit manoeuvre. It's, it's not a uniform tactic that UK police teach. We use tactical contact. So they'll say, well, what's tactical contact? We've got authority to ram a vehicle or take a vehicle out if it's going to be deemed necessary, reasonable and proportionate to the offence. Uh, and if we can do it properly. So if we can put it to bed and we can stop a pursuit before it starts, we can use tactical mm -hmm. contact. Tactical contact is whatever you want to make it. Ram it head on, run it sideways, T-bone it. But yeah, that's what we do is we'll do a pit manoeuvre. And we only do a pit manoeuvre through experience. We don't do it because we're taught to do it. We do it because we've done it 20 times in the past and it's worked. So yeah, it's not something that's taught. It's something we do. It's there and it's in your sandbox if you need it. It's in his, to it's in his toolbox, yeah. tucked away behind a big shroud. And then we will bring it out when we need to bring it out. And it does work fantastically. And you've also done pursuits with HGVs, haven't you? Not yeah, cars. yeah, we've done a few pursuits with some HGVs. One were on Bingley Bypass, um, and we had no idea how to stop it. Uh, first thing we did, we just called firearms in, uh, and firearms drove alongside the vehicle, showed them the wire, and eventually it did come to a stop, and the, they jumped out, because what do you do? We've got stingers that do take out trucks, but if that truck wants to go on a killing spree, and start mowing people down, how do you stop it? So we brought firearms in, so if it did do that, to take the driver out. I think there was one in America with a tank, I saw. I've seen, seen that, yeah. seen it on the internet? Yeah, I've on seen YouTube. that. Yeah. I mean, what do you do there? 
like? There, there is nothing. There's, there's, again, it'll be a firearms job or it's just to drive in front of it and make sure everyone gets out of your way as quickly as possible because you don't know what their intentions are. Are they just doing it for a bit of show? Or do they just want to cause a bit of devastation? Or are they trying to hurt people? If they're trying to hurt people, they need to be taken out. So we've got a thing called FSUP, which is for supervision. They're in an office and it lays on their shoulders. We'll be saying, where the eyes and ears, we'll be saying, right, the vehicle's doing this, that they call it in and if it gets too bad and it gets too dangerous that's when they can call in firearms and say right but you don't want anyone to die you don't want anyone to be injured no so i, I work in films doing stunt driving and stuff like that can i have a like, job well i mean you, you, you do the real job i just pretend so i've done some car chase stuff like with you know police cars bad boys three amazing spider-man two we had, about, we had 50 cars there chasing this this truck that was going completely crazy and it was it was mowing things in half and creating carnage in through New York or what looked like New York. I'm trying to think of some other um, why we've had police cars. Another one, Fast and Furious 6, we had car, you know, police cars in that. But of the films you've watched with your analytical eye, which ones do you think are the most realistic? To if, if I know that that's a stretch to say, but there must be one you think, okay, that's close. <clears throat> yeah, so if I'm watching anything, and no disrespect to if people are watching America, watching anything American, not a chance. It's got to be British. Stuff like, yeah, James Bond stuff, that's quite... Good there. I don't know if you know any stunt drivers from James Bond. I know a few. They're, yeah. they're some of the best. Yeah, yeah. So some James Looking. Bond stuff, yeah. Um, but one of the best ones I've watched that was realistic is the Sweeney. Okay, Have you watched yeah. that? I thought you'd say something like yeah, that. Yeah, the Sweeney, because it's very gritty. It, I think he's in a, an ST. Um, I think it's Focus ST and other ones in a... Is it a Jag? Yeah. Um, Nothing's exaggerated. Yeah, days, yeah, but it's that. It's, it's the very here and now. It's not about... A pursuit's not about how big something is. It's not about getting 50 cars there. And most pursuits are in, out, in, out, left, right, left, right, back alleyway, over over central reservations, over curbs. And yeah, they will push cars out way if they need to. They do go on curb areas, make people run out way. So we don't have the big streets we have in America. We don't have the fleets that they have in America. We don't have that many bobbies as what they do in America. So it needs to be snappy. It needs to be in and out and that sort of thing. And one of the main things was Sweeney. I think they got a really good... Um, they got it nailed on. I'm um, just trying to think what else. And when you watch things like, um, I know on Bond when he uh, there's a shoot out in the, um, I can't think which one it is, Skyfall in London. Sh yeah, yeah, shoot out and he runs and jumps in the Jag. Little thing. Was that you? That was me. Yeah, little things like that. That's quite Big bang when it went up the curb. Yeah, it broke the axle, <laughs> but it looked cool. So but yeah, fine. but that that's very nailed on. Is things like that as well. So. People need to be getting out of where it can't all be on freeways, and that's how they get a good essence of pursuit driving. So I hope we've done a good job today as well. Well, we'll I hope so too. But the um, it's okay. So you've done. I mean, you've if you if you have a career your length, in that time you're bound to have some offs. Same with racing. Yeah. You're gonna you know. Yeah. Anyone that says they never crashed a car hasn't gone fast enough. Yeah. On yeah. track. And but I mean, with what you do, it's it's inevitable. The contacts is inevitable. But, so you must have had a few shunts. In your time. Yeah, I've had a lot of shunts where I've been rammed. I've had a lot of shunts where I've rammed the stolen car and it's been brought to bed. But I've had a few mishaps and a few mishaps. Like as in, so one of them, we're in his VXR. We sat at top of uh, Rule this is the Vectra VXR. Vectra VXR, yeah. VXR 2.8. And I said, as we're saying, it's twin scroll turbo, but I say twin turbo, but I'm lazy. Um, sat at Rule Lane, traffic lights, and there was uh, pursuing an RS6. I can't remember what year where it was an early version of the RS6 and it was a lady called Claire behind it and she's Claire could hold her own, she was good. But we shouted out and we says, uh X ray on me five two, we sat at Ruler and ran back and you could hear it on the radio go, thank God, Ben and John are here. And when I'm sat there, I'm rubbing it, I'm thinking I'm game on here. I think it was sorry for my language, but the balls were that big, my head had swollen up and it was like, we're on. Your ego was writing checks, your body I, couldn't cash. My car couldn't cash it. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, we saw it come into view on Halifax Road. And we're like, yeah, we'll take over. We are ground commander. Stand by, stand by. We set off. I were only in first gear. Drop the donut. There you go. Well, I, yeah, pulled straight out. Uh, yeah, we're game on. We are now lead pursuit vehicle. Stand by. We are left, left, left. On, and then there were high curb. I, over, I overshot it. I, I understeered. Car drifted across the road. Took the front wheel off straight away. I've been in pursuit less than two seconds. And I were ground commander. Stand by. And we are out, out, out. We are not ground commander anymore. <laughs> That's a bad one. Uh, yeah, and it were things like that. So, but it's not through, it's not through zealousness. It's not through over exaggeration. Or, I mean, if you're driving, it's just I've got it wrong. Yeah. It what time, place, night? I've got it wrong. I hold my hands up. Um, one other times again going across some moorland as well. Ripped some out of a of a T five. Um, 
uh, I've smashed so many 330s up. But, but again, it's part of the job and you're driving at such a high level at all the time. You're driving 250 miles a night, that's five days a week, that's how many months, uh, weeks a year, how many years. You're driving thousands and thousands and thousands of miles, so per mile you're not having any crashes. But per shift mm -hmm. or whatever, yeah, you've got to, but that's how you learn. You've got to test, if you're getting in a 330 now and you need to be driving at 155 mile an hour in a pursuit, which we do, you've got to realise how that vehicle handles. And if we're pushing limits, we're going to have odd time, we're going to have a nod off, we're going to have a, a spin, we're going to have a, yeah, we're going to have a cook it. Sometimes we can't be perfect all the time, no one's perfect. And you'll have to say yourself, oh, well, how are you going to say that? Are you going to say you're perfect? No one's perfect. No. We're all human, you, yeah. you make mistakes. Yeah. The good thing with experience is that you tend to make less of them because you yeah. can see the risks better, yeah. more aware and alert, aren't you? It got slower. As the older you get, the slower you get. I think there were a time, literally 15, 16 years in, no, you want to stop for me. But then by the time you get a few more years on your back, thinking, I'm not doing this anymore. It's just getting too dangerous. It's too risky. And then when you're trying to box a vehicle in like 130 mile an hour, wing mirrors are coming off between yours and his. It's just, it's a scary place to be. When sparks are flying, you think, I don't want to be here. It's a scary place. What was your first car? Uh, first beat car was a, I think it were an R or an S range. It were an Astra 1.4, 1.6. It had a little Nino light on top. You could hear it rotator going round. It had a wheel trim missing. It handled like a bag of spanners. I don't think it had any near side suspension. Um, and it just got thrashed around Keefler. And it was brilliant. It felt like the first day you'd ever pass your test. Uh, but it was my car, my little baby. And everyone else had a Mark, oh, what it Mark 4 they brought out with a back, flat back. Yeah. Um, they had a Mark 4 and mine were a Mark 3. And I loved it. I just what thought it was that? brilliant. I think it was an RS. It was 1988. Okay. But they went from R to S on that plate. And I can't, I'm being, I can't remember if it was an R edge. I think it was an R edge. Um, and it was probably jam sandwiches outside. It just it was brilliant, and it was my little baby. And it had three lights. It had Nino, Woo Woo, and Police. And you used to press Police, and a little sign on top lit up. And is this patrol car? This were a patrol car. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So patrol car, no, no, not for pursuits. Yeah, there, there were some pursuits. Yeah, but it were old school then. It was kind of thing. They wanted as much health and safety in those days. You could do a. a it was classed as a safe follow. There's no such a lot thing of wheelchair, a yeah. lot of understeer. Yeah, a lot of understeer, uh, and we ended up smashing a few up as, as well. But again, it was just due to the time that we were out driving the cars, so to speak. Uh, and that's why I went to traffic, basically. They, they give me a big boy toy. I sound like I smash everything up and I don't. No, I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure you don't. But also, you know, you obviously love cars, and that's uh, one of the motivations to do what you've done. And um, so you were looking up, I mean, like, you, what's next? So yeah. what, 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 you know, there's a, food, there's a sort of pecking order up that, you know, as you go up the ladder, you get the more powerful yeah, car. Yeah, yeah. So I went from, then I went to uh, an Octavia VRS, which was the 1.8 turbo. The Skoda. Yeah, yeah that was 2002. Petrol. Petrol. And then we had a V6 Vectra, 2.5 litre uh, liter petrol. Um, that's what I call a shark nose version. Yeah. Um, we had a, uh, don't ask me why we had a Frontier. We had a 3 litre Frontier and we had a... Hang on, um, that's the 4x4. Yeah. I remember those. They yeah. had, they're pretty gutless and quite it, high. It, yeah, high, crap. It was crap. It was Sergeant's car, but we could take it out. And then we had a uh, Amiga. We had a three litre Amiga as well. Rear wheel drive. Rear wheel drive. That's and spicy. That were good, yeah. That were a good car. Three litre well. engine. It was three litre, yeah. And that were a good car. V8? Was that? No. No, I think it were a V6. I think it were a V6. The two and a half litre Vectra, that were a V6. That sounded fantastic, did that? So how do those two stack up? The Amiga versus the Vectra. What was the daddy? Uh, the Vectra. The Vectra had a, uh, one more old school and one more new old school, if that makes sense. Two and a half litre V6, it sounded fantastic. It looked good and it handled really, really well. They're tight, the Amiga yeah. a bit more wallowy. Yeah, it, re it really, low on its suspension, it held the road, it, it went front heavy and it controlled really well and it was really good for handbrake turns. I shouldn't really say that, should I? No, <laughs> but that's going in. So I'm not a Bobby anymore, I can say it. <laughs> <laughs> the, so the Amiga kind of was old school in the way of, I remember the Granada yeah. and um, that sort of lineage of <clears throat> sort of police muscle car that goes yeah. back to the, like, the Rover SD1, which yeah. was another boss police yeah. car. It's so like you had your Granadas and everything else. and you, you, Cavalier. So, yeah, they had Cavaliers, they had Capris, they had all sorts of stuff. But this was at the end of the old school, what yeah. we call shiny shoe brigade. They had tight, uh, uh, pants on with creases down front, they had a leather briefcase. Shiny shoes, that were the old school traffic cop. What you see on our old, our 80, a bit of the bill, PC stamp or Graham Cole or whatever it's called. Uh, and then we were the next generation in. Um, 
and then we're old hats now. If you look at all the young generations coming in, so we got the best of the cars at the time. Like you said, the the Octavia, um, things like that, uh, that would be coming out. We once got a Saab, a Saab 9.5 turbo on trial. What year? Uh, that was 2003. Okay. That were a good car. The Aero. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, Aero. So and that is one of the best handling cars I've ever driven. It yeah. was the last Saab, last Saab, which was basically a, a Vauxhall, but tuned. Yeah. And it, it was, it had, the handling was off the charts, and then the company just vanished. Yeah. They, they did some good stuff with those cars, and it, they were brilliant cars to drive. Um, because we used to get them all on trial, and it was like, right, have this for a couple of weeks, have that for a couple of weeks. And we have, I remember flapping that around Keefler. Um, but then we, we went to diesel Volvos, um, and it were horrendous. What are you going to do with that? No, we once got passed by a Micra. What are it, you supposed to do with that, then? Set them on fire, turn them upside down, use them as a skip. Okay. <laughs> That's got a le- but I mean, but seriously, what are you supposed to do with it? And then at that era, you've got people with Audi RS6s probably yeah. causing mayhem or RS3. All T5s have gone. We've gone, uh, VXRs have gone by this point, And then we've been given diesel Volvos because what the think or what the thought at the time was, uh, petrol's the enemy, diesel's the way forward. And there were no high performance diesel. There were, there were three litre Audis. Um, but the, someone's decided to give us Volvos and there were single turbo as well. They give us a single turbo D5 Volvos and they were an embarrassment. And they quickly got to the point of saying, yeah, we shouldn't have had these. So they got phased out again? They got phased out and we got 330s then. Yeah. We had um, 530s and 330s and then we went on to X5s as well. So when the BMW era came through, my best car in the world were Christine, which was the Vectra VXR. But when the BMW era came through, it was a different era. It was something completely different. We had the obviously our automatic DSG gearbox. We didn't have to worry about changing gears anymore. Yeah, we've got paddle shift, and a lot of us drove paddle shift, but we didn't have to think about it. That took us something else out of the pursuit. Well, when you're driving, you can free up. Yeah. So your hands on the wheel, as we were talking about, out of position, your hands on the wheel, you could use your stem, push the top button, and it freed a lot of driving up. So you could be more creative in what you were doing. You could do more things behind the wheel, like using your radio, which is attached to your body, your dash cam. It just changed it all completely. Which do you reckon is quicker between those two, the Vectra and the BM? We raced, <coughs> sorry, we trialled them both together. Yeah. The BM did beat the VXR, but only up to 80, 90 mile an hour. Then the VXR took past, because the VXR just shot of 170 miles an hour. Um, I, I know that because I got 163, 64 out of mine, and it still kept on pushing, where BMW is regulated to 155. Didn't some um, UK police have things like Super Impreza and, um, and VXR8? Yeah, the, the, so basically there's a list. This list doesn't exist, but it does exist. It depends who you talk to. So you can go and ask for anything on this list. So I've just been to Merseyside, I've just looked at their Kia Stinger, which is a 3.3 litre V6 turbo, very powerful car. But you speak to certain people in other forces, no, you've got to have Volvos or you've got to have BMWs. And to go to one fleet is wrong because as we've known now, there's an issue with BMWs overeating and the engine's going bang. And then you've got to give your fleet away. Which ones are going bang? Uh, new BMW engines. Are they? So that's why uh, police forces have cancelled the BMW contracts. Right. So now they're going back to Volvos, ironically. Um, but yeah, it's um, you should be able to pick what you want for the area you're working. So we're more urban, a bit rural, or this sort of thing. Or we're more rural, a bit urban, or we're all rural. You should pick the car for mm. your area. There's no point having a D5 if you're going to be on B roads all over the top part of Cumbria, down through Yorkshire, through Dales, you want something like an Evo, a Subaru, a Golf R, Golf GTI, mm. uh, certain places have got it. So each individual force will put there in what they want as a, a, as a business case and then sign it up. So as we say in Merseyside, they've got Subarus, sorry, not Subarus, they've got uh, Coopers, which is fantastic. Um, North Yorkshire have still got the M35s. Um, uh, the M340s, things like that. Then you go further down south, and the, the, obviously they've got different cars again. So uh, Mini Clubmans, I think at GMP, um, they're quite good apparently. They at Mini are. Clubmans, they, they're yeah. Quick. Um, so again, everyone's different, but again, they should be off. Obviously, this big list you should be able to pick what you want. So I've I've seen. I don't, what about Lamborghini? Again, I don't think you've got a business interest for a Lamborghini, although I know some people that have got, uh, I can't tell you who they are, but I know some people have got things that are very powerful that have got a Lamborghini engine in it. Really? Yes. What, unmarked type thing? I can't or... tell you that. Right. Because that's part of things that I can't talk about. Jeez, that's one to look out for. And it's got a Lamborghini engine in it. Really? Yeah. That's really, that's exciting. Yeah. So at some point, so this is the, this is the interesting thing. So things like the Vauxhall Vectra are now creeping up in value. Yeah. They, they're mostly, uh, this is a theory from Paul Cowan actually, 
who told me this years ago, but I started to see his logic. A lot of people didn't care about them and scrapped them, which yeah. means there aren't many left. But they were a really good car. That's why they were beloved by the police. Yeah. They're powerful. They have fantastic handling. And, and actually, it dwarfed a lot of the other models at the time. So they're now starting to come back in popularity. Yeah. But I mean, at some point, that Lambo presumably will be released into the wild again and um, it, someone will be able to buy it. Yeah, eventually. It, well, so one thing I'm going to say now is there's, I, I put out a post the other day about me with a plain car. There's a difference between an unmarked car and a covert car. So an unmarked car is a car such as a plain BMW, which you see driving around now. Blue lights in it, they've got a radio in it. I have all my kit on back, probably an Ivy's vest, and I'll be driving it in uniform. That's an unmarked car. Mm. That's not meant to be sneaky beaky. That is so we can just probably see you on your mobile phone before you've seen us. So when people go, oh, look, I can see it's a police officer. Yeah, you can. It's not a covert car. Covert car is, you'll never know it is. We won't know it is. It's registered to somebody else. It won't be sold as a police car. It won't go to stock. Um, it, it'll just never exist. So it'll be registered to a dummy company. So the idea being is people can't trace it back. So coverts are used for tourism, surveillance squad. Um, they're used for big, big jobs, and we don't even know they exist. So what we could be doing, I'll give you an example. We followed a, a, this war. 2012, we followed a, a Lexus IS200 at massive high speed through Keyflay, and I thought, oh, we've got a failed stop on. Put lights on, it pulled over quickly, jumped out, and I can't tell you the name of who they call themselves. But it showed us his one car straight away, it said who we were, and basically what they've got to do is they've got to get from position A to position B as fast as they can because there'll be a convoy coming up, being tailed by, say, 10 cars. They need to get to position B to fill in, to pull one of these 10 cars off. So the rotor of the car's turning around all the time. Someone will go, hang on a minute, this Golf's been behind me once, this Ford's been behind me once, and the cars that you never notice. And these are cars off a forecourt, these are cars that you'll never see, they're not police cars. And when people say, I can see when you can't, because there could be a British telecom van, a proper British telecom van. There could be, um, just to name it, there could be a London taxi. They're not, when people say they can see them, you can't see them. They don't exist. And they're the ones that are tricky. They're the ones that won't be sold off as police cars. So they get scrapped, I guess? They could be scrapped. They could be sold off to a private buyer. So the private buyer uh, might be someone that's gone through a vehicle fleet themselves, and it'll be just transferred to a private buyer and it'll just have a proper company on there. Okay. It'll never be seen, there's no holes in dashboard, it, it, you'll never know it's been a police car. Interesting. That's the difference between a covert car and an unmarked car. I did not know that. Oh, that's useful to know. So you've driven a ton of different cars and uh, you've chased a ton of different cars. Yeah. So you, you must have a pretty decent you know, feel for what you would want to own personally. Yeah. So what are you currently driving? I've got a Mark 8 Golf GTI. And how's that going? Uh, the truth. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's in garage more than it is on the road. Um, it's just fault after fault after fault. It's had three new steering wheels. It's electrical fault. I think it's got too much technology for it. I got told by someone at VW that we released it before it should have been released. Um, it's, it, I've, it, I think I've had it in 60 days in total in two years of not being with it because of the issues I've had with it. I love the car. It drives fantastic. It's got every option extra that the Golf can have. But yeah, I'd rather have a 7.5. That's what I've got. Yeah, I well, think it's. I don't have that. That's my wife's car. I think it's a fantastic car. It is a great car. I've, I've read on the forums that, that they had some electrical trouble in the eight. Yeah. Um, it seems you've verified that. Yeah, yeah, I have. I'm not going to look at the camera and say don't buy an eight, but don't buy an eight. <laughs> <laughs> That's rough, but it's honest. But, yeah. I'm being honest. Yeah. I can't. I can't lie because if someone said what car would you, I wouldn't do it, and I'd right. never. If someone said hand it back now and go get a, a brand new Mark Eight. Well, you've got two weeks before this film comes out to sell it. Yeah. So then, uh, no, it's not going to happen. Then you'll be safe. It's not going to happen. So yeah. Uh, but if I could pick a car now, any car to have, um, my ultimate car, the car I want, is an Escort Cosworth. They're great. I want an Escort Cosworth. I want probably a '94, '93, '94. I want a Lux. I want a small turbo one. I don't want the big turbo one. I want a small turbo one, and I want mine. will probably have it in. I think is it Guards Red to do it in or Aubergine? Just something a bit different, leather interior. As a day-to-day -day drive now, um, I, I personally think Skoda up and coming. I love the Skodas. Uh, I'd have an Audi. I wouldn't have an S, um, apart from if it was the saloon, mm -hmm. because I think if it's Natchback, you look too much like a burglar, and there's too many stolen, so I'd have a saloon, or I'd have a convertible version. They're too stiff for me. Yeah, do you think? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The suspension's got so hard on them. I just... Yeah. But I think there's a difference between having a performance car now and a car that goes quick as well. Performance cars, we're getting a point on road now where the speed camera's everywhere. 
you're gonna just someone's gonna do you for something so there's no point i'd rather have a car that went quick mm. that wasn't a performance car so you're looking at something just say for instance um pick something out of the top of my head i won't mind a velar i won't mind a, the the the, the Valar. yeah yeah a velar they do the um autobiography one don't they so i think it's yep. a three litre v6 that's quick um but it's not a it's not a race car it's, that's police as well uh, no, I, ooh, ooh, we didn't. Ooh, when did we get rid of his Range Rovers? 2014, I think we got rid of all Range Rovers. There were two boxy and two high, but I think some forces are doing them. Forces are going on Teslas now as well. I think Merseyside have got one of the first Teslas as well. Um, and they're having a. Oh, God, what's it called now? What's the box? Alpine, Alpine. They're having an no, Alpine. The Alpine. Yeah, they're having, yeah, they're having Alpine. What, the sports car? Yeah. They're great side. little cars. Yeah. Have you driven one of them? No. They are wicked. So that's why I'm going back over there. So yeah. watch that space. All right. Well, next, the next film we try and do, let's get in an Alpine. <laughs> Deal. You'll bring it. I'll drive it. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> ben, thank you for sharing your stories. Thank um, you so much, Brilliant mate. to meet you. And um, yeah, look forward to doing some more stuff. We definitely need to get up some adventures. Go out and um, I think go and check out what they're doing in America. Yeah. Uh, if Trust you want to take cars. me, I'll, I'll go. And if anyone's watching from America, big it up and let's go and do it. Game on. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in, guys, and see you on the next adventure.